um, Professor Smasha is a uh, 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 professor at the computer science department at the University of uh, Wisconsin Medicine, and his work is very broad and focused on the analysis of security protocols, civilian ability analysis, intrusion detections, formal method for security, and uh, analyzing malicious code, etc. I think maybe indeed, just uh, as Lego mentioned, there are a lot of uncertain and uh, uh, hardness for the robustness of machine learning. Uh, but whether we can, you know, apply some uh, security analysis like formal method etc of uh, types of principles to machine learning and analyzing I think that's indeed really exciting but indeed very challenging so I think in today's talk um, Professor uh, Zhao would give some interesting uh, insights and uh, maybe pointers about uh, this topic on the past present and future of trustworthy machine learning uh, thank you uh, welcome you know, the football football season is starting. So this is a little bit of a head fake talk. I kind of switched some of the things around. So this is more, it's kind of like uh, Zico's, the end of Zico's talk. It's supposed to be more thought provoking than maybe providing solutions. Um, so unfortunately, and maybe uh, Zico's talk at the end said the same thing. We have more questions than answers. So uh, even though, Bo's uh, intro said that, I, I would say this is more sort of uh, um, a talk that raises questions than provides answers. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to kind of uh, piggyback of uh, the closing remarks uh, from Zico Coulter and sort of key takeaways as we, we sort of um, need a more systems level perspective like red teaming, so on, which we are aware of in, in, in other things in security, we need the same kind of mindset in ML, okay? Um, the, so one thing that, and, the, and the, so, so sort of a more security kind of a mindset, if you will. Um, and the third thing I wanted to say is that one thing that, happens is happening quite a bit is, um, you know, you're waiting, for, you know, papers come out, you have your ICML, new RIPS paper, you give your talk, you feel good. And then, you know, in a few months, you have somebody like Nicholas Carlini or somebody sort of break it. Um, and the, the, I think one of the key things is unless we can clone some people like Nicholas Carlini and I make a billion of those, what we need is some sort of an automatic way of you know, evaluating them sort of, I, I would draw analogy to things like, uh, you know, kind of differential crypto analysis of symmetric crypto systems, static dynamics analysis to find vulnerabilities, that sort of stuff. Okay, now this is, this is the case I want to make. I hope I can in this talk make a better case than these people did for election fraud. So, um, and I'm not gonna go through, uh, you already did, an extremely, uh, you know, Alex uh, and Zico are very hard to follow. I'm not going to give a big intro into ML and adversarial machine learning. You got a lot of it. Uh, all, I, I, all I wanted to say is that, you know, I'm just gonna, you know, it's used a lot in adversarial settings and adversarial attacks is an issue. Um, and I'm all, all, that's all I'm gonna say for that because you already saw two great talks on that topic. So all, the, all I want you to take from, I'm gonna, the skip slides is machine learning is important. There are a lot of adversarial attacks on machine learning in security critical or, or, or settings. Okay, so uh, I was having a discussion with one of our ML colleagues here, uh, Jerry Zhu, and sort of he asked saying a very good question and I, I kind of had to think about it a little bit. What is different about, by the way, I'm kind of lumping security, privacy, crypto as SPC, uh, but you know, just, 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 just think sort of the SPC crowd, like Oakland CCS uh, using security, that sort of stuff, right? So he was saying, okay, what is kind of difference between, what is, what is kind of the mindset here, right? Because I think we were, we were discussing why do, it happens that the papers come out and you know they get broken and so on, right? So at a very high level, most security, privacy, crypto, and, and again, this is this is this is a little bit of a 10,000 foot uh, view. 
follow this kind of a model to analyze the resilience slash robustness of their system, right? So you have a system or a primitive called SIS. You have some security goal. You have a threat model, which tells you what an attacker can really do. And then you have a, some security assumption on which the security uh, of your system is based on. So in crypto, it might be some pro hardness of some problem like factoring, discrete log. Um, in systems, it might be, hey, certain, certain program elements might be in a TCB or a protected memory so that people can tamper with, right? By the way, I think if it's okay with the organizers, I'm okay if people ask questions as I'm giving the talk, I don't have to wait for them. It makes for a better talk. So I'm, I'm okay if people can unmute. If you just ask questions, that's fine. Okay, and uh, most of our security arguments or proofs, and I don't mean that every security paper has a proof. You know, some of them have an, what quote unquote, an argument, I would say, right? That if an adversary following the threat model can violate the, violate the goal, for example, in control flow integrity, put your path to the program that doesn't follow the control flow graph, then we say that A has to violate the security assumption. So either A has to be able to tamper with the TCB or protected memory, or can solve some hard problem efficiently. Okay, and that's kind of what the the, the last statement is saying, sort of uh, informally. Now I don't mean to. Uh, by the way, I don't mean want to imply every security, you know, paper has this kind of. But at least it should, even though I, I don't mean to have a proof, but kind of this is an argument you want to make, right? Now, how do these systems and primitives really get broken, um, sort of, if, if you see the breaks? Uh, you sort of have <clears throat> sometimes <clears throat> really pap papers with very shoddy proofs and arguments. So that's kind of a low hung, lang low hanging fruit. <clears throat> the threat model might be too weak. And I think Zico was talking about that, right? I mean, you know, you might say, oh, my threat model is I can only change one pixel. Well, well, good luck. And, you know, attackers don't listen to uh, researchers, right? Um, the security assumption is not valid. Like, you know, you move, move to a quantum computer, factoring is easy, correct? So now what is interesting is when some brand new and ingenious attacks are found. So uh, some events from history that come to mind are um, um, like power analysis of uh, Paul Kocher, where you, he, he realized that by looking at sort of some of the, you know, power spectrum of crypto systems, you can actually get extra information and extract the key. Like the ROP gadgets work of Hobart, um, so once, to me, the last one is kind of more interesting, right? Because that kind of moves the field forward. Okay, I just want you to keep that in mind. Now, I saw some, you know, people like Nikita and other people on, 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 the, on the call, this attack fix cycle in our community is, is quite, almost like an integral part of the community. You know, I, I, I don't know whether you guys remember the early days of Lattice crypto systems, a lot of those things were broken and then, you know, the field kept moving and then, the, you know, now the systems, you know, so it is, it is kind of an integral part of our field, okay? It is, uh, it is sort of something that we take as an integral, I mean, that's why if you look at security conferences, we do have a lot of attack papers, right? Um, now, what I find is that is actually not true in other communities like machine learning, architecture, and so on. I remember when the Meltdown Spectre <laughs> attacks came out, a lot of the architects, when I mean architects, I don't mean here people building buildings, these are the computer architects. Um, they sort of reacted really badly to it, right? And they're like, oh, what is this? You know, the security people have nothing better to do and they keep poking holes and things and so on and so forth. I still remember, we have a pretty strong architecture group here 
And they were like, oh, what is this? You know, nobody was just ever going to do this in real life or something like that, right? And, you know, guess what? Now, if you look at ISCA or micro or something, I mean, there's a bunch of papers on these kind of topics. But all I wanted to say is that this is very important. Uh, this, this attack pick cycle is, is part of our DNA in some way. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, going back to my previous premise, uh, what, I, what I really want to do is try to make my case through the lens of these two papers that we recently I was involved in, more as sort of an illustration to, to sort of then synthesize some um, sort of uh, arguments, okay? So the first paper is, uh, we broke a system called InstaHide, which was an ICML paper. This was in Oakland this year. Um, and I'm gonna briefly describe the two papers, and then we will pop back up and tie it back to some of my, of the earlier remarks that I had. Okay, so um, uh, I, I don't want to say too much about this. In machine learning, you have a sort of a, a bunch of images uh, labeled by a sort of a concept function. You learn, and the idea is that this should be able to give you predictions that is close to, uh, you know, the, the concept function that you, you label your images with. Okay. What is the benefit of, what, what does instance encoding uh, sort of um, try to do? By the way, um, <laughs> there are a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, the, even quite a few new editions this year, which a lot of the area chairs keep contacting me saying, hey, can you review this? This is, tries to use instance encoding. It tries to fix the attack that we had. So essentially here the idea is you take, a bunch of images and you encode them using some function E, which, uh, and then you learn over these encoded functions. Now, now the premise here is that if your encoding function is hiding a lot of things, then you are high, you're learning over some sort of, you're protecting the privacy of the training data, okay? Uh, you know, I mean, so if you want to take this argument to the limit, Think about this. If I take an image and I, I'm able to completely randomize and blur it and still learn something, it, something from it, wouldn't that be great because it will protect the privacy of everything it is, okay? But it, it seems to me that you probably, everybody on the, on the call would agree that this is too good to be true, right? I mean, if I can learn, if I could have an encoding function that could just completely and you know randomize the images and you still learn well that doesn't seem sort of at least intuitive intuitively there is something that should splinter in your mind right um, now notice that all the the premise of all this is that things like very principal techniques like DPSGD SGD with uh, difference privacy the accuracy drop is quite high uh, quite should I say high or low Accuracy drop is quite drastic. Um, maybe somebody can put it on chat, but I think I have seen quite a bit accuracy drop. So all these schemes are trying to get that DPSGD accuracy drop back, okay? Um, and uh, the idea is this, this encoding is kind of private. So you are learning over it. So you're no, not learning anything sensitive that was in the images, right? Um, so this is what essentially this one says as well. Now uh, there was this inst there was an Insta Hide paper which is uh, which was uh, in ICML 2020 I think uh, which is a encoding scheme. Uh, it was led by um, some very prominent researchers from Princeton, um, Sanjeev Arora, Kylie, and uh, a couple of their students, and it won the Bell Labs Prize. Um, in, I think, uh, I think 2020. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the, the, the picture from there. Um, now, uh, to be honest, I started reading the paper more out of curiosity. You know, I, 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 I just to, just because we broke it, I don't want to kind of, uh, you know, uh, take shots at this paper. The paper is actually quite well written. Okay. I, I actually had, a, it was a pleasure to read the paper actually. 
But I think there was something in there. And I said, you know, that we all came, all, all my co-authors came with this mentality that, look, there is something here. It must, if it is getting that good utility, there is something going on. Okay, that's that's how we got to this this work. Uh, now a little bit about InstaHide. Everybody probably doesn't have the, a paper, uh, so we had two questions that in Oakland, this Oakland paper that we tried to address: Is InstaHide private, and can something like InstaHide, an encoding scheme like InstaHide, be private? And the um, answers to both questions uh, was a no. Okay, so very very rough. Um, description of the InstaHide algorithm. So InstaHide algorithm requires two data sets, a private and a public data set. So think about private is sort of your health record, uh, you know, your sort of the radiology readings or whatever. Your public data set might be, I don't know, you scrape Instagram or Facebook or whatever, okay? And then uh, I don't know whether, uh, probably the machine learning people know this work. There is this paper called MixUp. So this is the mix up step of InstaHide. It basically uh, mixes images from private and public images and also uh, mixes the labels. Uh, this is a, I don't know, four or five years back. So this is kind of the mix up step if you're interested uh, in that. Then there is, once you get this mixed up image, there is this um, random sign flipping uh, step that they do. Okay, and that's what this is. And that gives you the InstaHide algorithm. Every picture goes through this mix up plus random sign flipping step. Okay. And the idea is these encoded images, you run your neural network algorithm on, and these were encoded, encoded in some way. They are not releasing sensitive information from the private set. Perfect. That's what this says. Now, uh, what we found is that, um, again, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm hiding a lot of details. You can probably go to the paper to, to get that. We, we found that, and, and intuitively, it kind of makes sense, right? I mean, if you, are, um, if you are able to get very high accuracy on these encoded images, they must be sh keeping some signal from the original image. And what happened is, in some way, we were able to cluster the encoded images such that encodings of the same images clustered properly, okay? So this, you can think about, roughly speaking, these clusters as encodings of the same image. And um, we use this to uh, get, device an attack on InstaHide, and essentially, we were able to get uh, pretty good. So this, uh, you can see on the left, these uh, on the top, these are original images. And on the bottom, these are the extracted images from our at attack. So, uh, I mean, you can, uh, you can go to our paper, we have a gallery of these things there. Um, and um, then we, we uh, answered the question, can anything uh, like um, InstaHide be um, sort of private. So remember here, the, uh, our function is an encoding function E and a learning function L, right? And um, what we do here is we design sort of a game. And if uh, for crypto people, you can probably see this is very much like the semantic security game. So the game we have here is that you have two images here. One is a dog. And um, you know this looks like a black dog, is it? Yeah, I, I don't know. The image is not that great. You encode them using your encoding function e. Uh, these two images are picked by the adversary, by the way, and you and uh, you take pick one randomly and give that encoded image to the adversary. The adversary has to guess whether this is an encoding of this, uh, the 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 white dog or the black dog. Okay. So, so remember, this is very, if you have done a crypto class, this is very similar to this cipher text game where an adversary picks two messages, M0, M1, sends to the encryption scheme. The encryption scheme picks one message randomly, encrypts it, sends the cipher text to um, the adversary. The, the adversary has to guess which, which message was encrypted, right? 
Excellent. Um, and what we prove is, and I'm not going to go too much into the, the theory part here. Um, I don't know how much how much time do I do do I have, uh, Bo? I think you still have five minutes, but you can go more than five. Okay, <laughs> Ten, okay. I, I will try to uh, <laughs> uh, sort of uh, you know uh, go a little faster. Sorry about that. And um, is is what we basically show is that if your encoding plus learning protocol has accuracy better than random for two concepts function C1 and C2, then there is a polynomial time adversary that can win that game. We call it the indistinguishability privacy game, uh, just like uh, you know, the, the in, in CPA and so on and so forth with advantage uh, better than a RAM. Okay, so that means the encoding is leaking information. And I'm not gonna uh, do that. And so we basically solved the Insta hide challenge. This is kind of the recovered images from the challenge. Now, um, does this really invalidate the Insta hide security claim? Well, I don't know because there isn't like a formal proof in the paper that says, hey, if you break Insta hide, you can solve this hard problem. So at least technically we haven't broken the scheme, right? Now, I will try to go over this very quickly. There was uh, a scheme uh, called NeuraCrypt, uh, Neura, like uh, Neural Network Crypt, um, which we also recently broke. And there also, it, it's sort of like Insta Hive, but they have slightly better guarantees where, um, and I'm not the scheme too much, but here is the paper. Um, you know the the, the bottom. Um, this is the this is the neurocrypt paper. The bottom line is we broke it, um, and there's a PPML paper on it. Okay, uh, so this is again sort of a um, uh, instance encoding type scheme. So uh, in in uh, in uh, due to the time limit, I will sort of just go. I won't sort of go into it too much, but essentially. Um, they had two challenges also they released and we solved the challenge one with perfect accuracy. And we argue in our PPML paper, which is now on archive, uh, that challenge two is not reasonable. It's like full key recovery attack for um, you know, crypto systems, which, which, is, which is not really, I don't know, that's, that's a two. I mean, it's like basically saying, okay, here is AES, I show you some of the cipher texts of AES, recover the key. Okay, so we, we argue that that's not reasonable. Okay, I'm just going to go, uh, I am sorry. So summary is uh, NeuroCrypt is not private. Challenge one, we completely, they had two challenges. Challenge one, we completely are successful at, and we argue that challenge two is really not relevant for privacy. And we also have a theoretical result that, you know, maybe an ideal encoding like what they want is not possible. Um, and uh, on that, I will sort of now go to my closing pitch and say that, you know, we need more sort of this security crypto mindset in, in this setting. And I think Zico also probably talked about that. And we illustrated this using the InstaHide and the NeuroCrypt uh, break. And you can look at our Oakland and PPML papers. By the way, you should you should you should look at that link that I just put here, uh, and look at the comments too. It's it's very interesting illustration of mindset difference that I was talking about. Now, um, in some sense, I, instance encoding is not isolated case. You know, I see this kind of like very informal security notions in model work, motor marking, model theft, black box. So I don't want to pick on instance encoding. That was more an exact um, sort of, um, you know, and just, just an illustration. And, you know, the idea is that at least, at a, this is hard to say, but most of the papers, all they do is they will just take existing attacks and run. 
they kind of don't get into. And this is where, um, you know, as I was saying, we short of uh, cloning uh, Carlini, um, we need some way of formally evaluating the robustness of these systems. Um, so now many ML security projects are releasing challenges, okay? Um, and what we also claim in the Oakland paper is that's of, of challenge is good, but that is not a substitute for having a formal security claim and a threat analysis, okay? Um, so uh, for example, um, if, if you have taken a crypto class, um, you know, when they define um, the int CPA game for the chosen plain tech attack on for RSA, you basically, you generate a public private key, then um, you basically, uh, obviously the public key is given to the adversary A1, you adversary picks two messages M0, M1, you, <clears throat> the challenger picks a bit, zero or one, encrypts either zero or one, depending on the bit, gives that cipher text to C star, and then, then the adversary has to guess what bit it is, B prime. If they guess the same, then the adversary has won. If they don't guess, then they, they lose. And if you remember the formal statement of that says, for all an encryption scheme is in CPA secure, if for all ad PPTA adversaries, the probability of the give, winning the game is half plus negligible function of some security parameter like the key length, right? Now notice that you cannot design a, a security uh, challenge for this because there is a quantifier there for all PPT adversaries. So you, you instantiate and then have one security challenge. So you cannot have a static security challenge that proves that something is in CPA secure. Okay, uh, now the solving a challenge, for example, you know, people, uh, uh, NIST has these factoring challenges and if you are able to factor these sort of uh, big numbers, you know that for those parameters, RSA is not secure, but that challenge is not a substitute for a proof, okay? Um, yeah, so the, a challenge is not sufficient, right? A Zodiac cipher um, withstood crypto analysis for 50 years, but it's not a secure encryption scheme by any means. So that's what I mean. So. You should, we should at least be striving towards having a formal definition, formal threat model, okay? Second is we should go beyond just attacking your defense with its existing attacks. And this is where we need maybe a more work into defining formal framework for adaptive attacks. The analogy here is something like differential crypto analysis for um, symmetric crypto systems. Um, now, a lot of times I've seen a lot of defenses still get published where they say, oh, we hide the defense algorithm from the attacker. Well, we know that is not a good strategy. Uh, I mean, security people will never um, do that. Um, as, as one of my co-authors said, attackers can also have access to archive just like all of us, uh, we do. Now, the, the last one is, please don't forget older fields. There used to be this field in, um, I think some of the old timers probably remember uh, information hiding, uh, which somehow, I don't know what happened to that uh, workshop or conference. There used to be an information hiding workshop. And a lot of the mo model watermarking, model theft uh, work that I'm seeing is repeating the mistakes from that field, okay? Um, so, so again, I think knowing kind of your history there is important. And on that note, I'm just going to end given my sort of, um, you know, um, give, given the time, but that's, that's kind of where I'm going to end. And this is my sort of end of slide. Formal security game plus challenge is greater than <laughs> formal security claims is much greater than just having a challenge is much greater than having nothing. That's, this, is, this is the slide I'll end with. And maybe I can, uh, people can have, have questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the very intriguing uh, talk.